Hello and welcome to the PMQ Live Update for Tuesday, May 12th. I'm Brian Hernandez in my home office again. Hopefully I will be getting back to the office soon, probably next week. and uh, have a little bit better reception, uh, better internet. Uh, I do appreciate everybody struggling through this with me. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, but as long as you guys can hear the information coming from my guests, that's the important part. And speaking of guests, I got a very special one today. My good friend, uh, U.S. Beats Team Premier member, Tori Trupiano of Monte Bebe in Oceanside, California. Say hi, Tori. Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing today? We're great, Tori. Yeah, they're, they're, they're speaking to you, uh, you know, virtually. So I did want to say <laughs> again, and I'll let people know again, uh, ask their comments in the Facebook uh Ask your comments live through Facebook comment section, and we can put them up there. Uh, we're going to talk about some unique things that Tori's doing uh, out there in California, uh, some of the pivots he's had to make, and a, a complete flip-flop on business model and why he likes what he's doing now better than what he was doing during the situation, if that makes sense. Uh, we'll get to that, so stick around. So, uh, Tori, why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself um, and uh, where you're at and what you do in three minutes or less. All right, so um, my name is Tori Tripiano, an active member of the United States Pizza Team. Um, I own and operate with uh, my business partner, Ann uh, Manja Bebe in Oceanside, California. And we're going through this COVID-19 uh, thing together. When I say together, I mean between uh, staff and customers. We're, we're really all in this together. It, this is real. This is really happening. I had to unmute myself there. Uh, so, all right, Jason Williams says hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in again, Jason. He's uh, become a, a loyal fan here. Um, he's getting a lot of good information from all my guests, my fellow comrades in pizza. So, again, you said we're all in this together. So this is about what this is, is you guys giving information and kind of ideas to people in the same situation. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what was the first thing, first adjustment you had to make? When did you realize this was – oh crap, this is happening, what was the first adjustment you made and kind of up to where you're doing now, but without going into a lot of detail, because we're going to talk about some of those uh, adaptations you made. But, you know, what, what was the first thing you did, the first pivot you had to make? Well, for us, uh, because I still have family in Italy, what we were watching is kind of like what they were going through. And at that time, it was, I still feel like I'm in denial on some things. Um, but at that part, it was just more of a learning experience. And, and I think denial is actually the perfect word for this. Uh, so as we were watching what was happening in Europe, I remember, I believe it might have been the 15th, whatever that Sunday was, talking to my customers and saying like, wow, this is it. This is the last time you're going to be sitting here in this restaurant until these new rules come into play. And I just remember the whole time thinking like, I don't want to do this. I, I want to run my business the way that my business is supposed to be ran. We're a restaurant. We have booths. We have tables. People come in. We'll first, we're full service. We have wait staff and busters, hostesses, food runners, all the components that we need to run a successful restaurant. And when they told us, it's like, okay, well, starting tomorrow, that's it. You can't do that anymore. And I thought to myself, no, well, wait a second, though. Like, we're not set up to be anything else than a restaurant. We're not a to-go place. We're not. We have pizza. Of course we have pizza. But people come in and they sit down and they enjoy it. Um, I do use third-party delivery apps as a convenience for my customers. That was nothing. That was not the program. That was not what we intended it to be when we signed up for it to be kind of like one of our, our sole sources of income. So starting at that point, it was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of questions because we actually didn't know what was going to happen. My customers don't know how to order to go from me. They don't know how to order delivery from me because they're the ones that came in with reservations, sat down, got served, paid their bill and went home. So that was the first stage. And I guess confusion was the best way to describe it because we didn't know what we were doing in the beginning. Well, that's, that's, not, that's again, that's that. Well, that's that pivot from uh, dine-in to, uh, you know, just 
dine in, but go and slowly carry out contactless curbside stuff like that. I mean, that's that sounds exactly. like it's a big pivot for everybody. And at that point, you know, I think probably the first week, week and a half, maybe the first few weeks, um, it was an adjustment. Adjustment, obviously, to our workload, our scheduling, and then also into an adjustment to seeing sales plummet drastically by 75%. Because at that time, my customers didn't know what to do. They were just as confused as we were. They didn't know how to get my food that they've been enjoying to them. And that's when Ann and I sat down and we said, okay, you know what? This is the time that we have to go outside the box. We have to figure out like what is going to what is going to work for us because we got to reconnect. We have to figure out how does Manja Bebe and our customers reconnect again, and that's where that's where it all started. Um, from that right. moment. Well, I just want to say that, I mean, like you said, that's kind of leading into the next point, actually, right there is the customer retention. So this was always first and foremost on your mind is how are you guys going to reconnect? Um, well, kind of walk us down that road. How how have you been dealing with that? I mean, why don't you actually kind of tell us what the, the mandates are in California right now? Is, is the state opened up? Um, are you at a certain capacity? What are regulations you have to follow? So nothing has changed for us yet other than, I believe it was uh, last Friday, they did open up the beaches again. So you can walk on the beach, you can swim, you can surf, you cannot stand, sit, or lay down. So it has to be a constant movement. Um, I don't know if you watched the news, but there was quite an uproar. You know, when you live coastal, especially this time of the year, the weather's starting to get really nice again. Um, it's hard to tell the masses that they, they can't go to the beach. And, and I think the population kind of made themselves be heard and, and that was changed. But as far as <laughs> customer retention goes, uh, that was our first focus because what we had to figure out is it's all about, um, it's a popularity contest right now because you have all these customers out there that are confused they really don't know how to get their food. I mean, yes, there's those the big chains that we know that you know you call them up, they deliver, but that's not who my customer is. So what we started doing was at that point, we started to really get involved with social media, um, just flooding our pages, our Instagram pages, our um, Facebook pages, letting people know, hey, we're here for you. You can order to go. You can order for delivery. Um, don't let this stop you. And that was kind of like our first phase in what we needed to do to get this going. All right. So, I mean, that, I mean, again, that was another pivot to where you, now you're into a different market where you're actually competing with people who are already set up for delivery and carry out. Uh, you're saying that one of the big things that you had to do as far as customer retention is just kind of like flood the market or your social media, but just be there, be present and, and uh, you know, make sure that everybody's seeing you. What are some of the things that you've kind of done in that respect that you weren't doing before in social media? Everybody's putting their pictures up and stuff like that, but what were some of the changes you actually did? So, in the beginning, what we started, you know, I, I should say in the beginning, but when we were running just as a regular restaurant, um, we did have social media presence, but our social media presence was uh, showing our new specials, introducing uh, new kitchen staff, uh, publicizing our wine dinners and special events that we did, the holidays. Um, that's kind of what we were used to. Well, obviously, that wasn't going to work anymore. So how do we keep our name in front of our customers so they don't forget us and also keeping it exciting. So one of the first things that we did was uh, a do-it-yourself pizza kit because it, my oldest ones are home from college, but I still have a young one. And uh, so we just needed to figure out like, how do we keep these kids entertained? What can we do? So we started with the do-it-yourself pizza kit. And again, I was in denial because I thought to myself, who is going to want to do this at home? Oh my gosh. 
Um, I, I was making batches of dough every day and selling about a hundred a day um, just for people coming in. And I thought like, okay, you know what? Let's take this to the next level. What we did is we took the do-it-yourself kits and we made a contest out of it. So the winner received a $25 gift certificate that they can use at the restaurant. And again, what that did is that kept the, uh, the customer not only entertained, but manja bebe, manja bebe, just constantly in front of them, letting them know, you know what, they're there for us. This is what they're doing. And I loved how, you know, the pop, how it became so popular. And then I'm not saying I invented it or I'm the first one, but I did see a lot of, uh, a lot of my competition. And then, you know, my friends, you know, doing the same thing. And you know what, it's at that point now, do what, whatever works for you, because what works for me might not necessarily work for you or vice versa. But right now we're at that point where I'm willing to try anything because I've worked too hard and too long to let this go to the wayside. I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to this. I'm going to continue what I'm doing, no matter what I have to do to keep this afloat. No, absolutely. I mean, it, we all have to, and I'm trying to switch cameras. I apologize again. It's getting a little slow, but uh, we all have to kind of pivot and, and do what we can to at least stay afloat. I mean, that's at least the, the main goal. I know a lot of people are showing bigger numbers here in the last couple of weeks when, with things opening up, but um, first, so we got to be prepared for when that goes back down again, almost back to a normal. So, um, so, I mean, besides like the pizza kits, you were talking about virtual wine dinners. And of course, I cannot give you a good example of virtual right now because my internet's not being all weird. But how are you doing these virtual wine dinners? What's that about? <laughs> That's something you think I'd never heard. Okay. So, again, um, I'll, I'll keep using the word denial because I'm very much in denial. <laughs> uh, my wine rep came to me and, uh, and, and we were talking and we were just talking about, you know, the good old days and the, our wine dinners, how we would sell out every single one and the popularity of it and how people would sign up for the next one before they would even leave the one that they were at. So, again, we talked about what about if we do a virtual wine dinner where we prepackage all the food, we prepackage all the wine, people come, pick up their order, go home, log into um, a model like we're using right now. And, and that's what we did. And I thought to myself, nobody in their right mind is going to want to do this, but you know what? We tried it. Um, we sold out and I actually wow. participated in it. It was so much fun. I will tell you what it did for about an hour. It made me forget about COVID-19 and it actually brought back that warm, tingly feeling of normalcy. Um, I got to see my customers. I got to talk and interact with them. And they got to enjoy my food and wine. And it, it was just that warm, fuzzy feeling when it was over because this is what we have now. This is how, this is what the world is. Until it goes back to whatever kind of, whatever the next normal is, this is what we're dealing with. Well, no, you're absolutely right. It's that feeling of normalcy. And uh, I know people like myself who work in an office, we can do this stuff virtually a lot. Yeah, so that was on my side. Anyway, a lot of us are able to do this virtually when their internet doesn't suck. <laughs> and uh, but you know th th that was kind of a unique thing bringing your your customers back virtually, um, you know, in back into the restaurant more or less. So um, I think that's a great um, a unique idea that people can maybe incorporate. Now, granted, we are starting to open up, but who knows how how much and how long we can. So. Uh, I did want to kind of talk to you about a couple other things that you had. I mean, one of the main things that you had said to me was, you know, step outside your comfort zone. I mean, this is there's no old normal anymore. It's going to be a new normal. But um, you had to do a big pivot being a, a dining carryout. Um, 
and you wanted you moved into basically just the heading as food programs and i do want to say we do have a lot of viewers uh victoria's bringing a great audience sorry for the technical difficulties but ask your questions in the comments i see jason william there's rudy waldner uh yeah i'm here now i hope you can hear me sorry buddy uh but uh jason williams says it's great motivation uh so ask your questions there we can get them up and rudy or i'm sorry tori can answer them but food programs you said uh you're doing something now that's pretty unique that, to where you're not even really thinking about opening up at a lower capacity in your dining room why don't you kind of embellish on that for us a little bit that's correct brian so, so um, um right after this started and our dining rooms were shut down and we were kind of just scrambling to see what the next move was and you know, the pizza kits were working, the wine dinners were working. Um, we did get a phone call, uh, but one of our PR persons, and her name is Brooke, and I mean, just, she's an amazing person, and I owe so much to her. Um, she said, you know what? There's this program to feed the seniors in our community. Would you be interested in providing meals for them? And I said, yes, I would. And they said, well, it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, when she said lunch and dinner, I said, no brainer. But breakfast... We're Italian. I, I don't have those ingredients. So I had a meeting with my chef and we went over what the parameters were, what they were looking for. So uh, low sodium, not sugary. Um, there was actually a, a, a few dietary restraints that we had to abide by. And then also one of the main keys was they didn't want to eat the same thing every day. You know, they wanted variety. So um I thought, you know, that just means that they don't want to eat, you know, spaghetti every day. Well, that wasn't the case. It was um, the ethnicity of it as well. So I told my chef, I said, listen, between all of us here, we have so much experience. We've worked at so many different types of restaurants and resorts. We can produce any type of food that they're asking for. So I got back to them and I said, you know what? We'll do it. They were picking up breakfast at 6.45 in the morning. And to get up that early for me was... Again, another pivot, but I had to do it. Uh, from that point, you know, that's how we started. And then we got another phone call for another program. Um, one of the hospitals that lost their program for food, and they asked us if we wanted to step in and do that. And again, we went through the parameters and what they were looking for. And again, they weren't looking so much for me or my food or manja they were looking for someone that could provide meals for them so how, that, how did that uh, first come around you said it was just one person kind of reached out to you and maybe the word spread i mean would you suggest people getting involved in local chambers of commerce or i mean because there's got to be other programs in other towns that have lost their capability to be able to produce food i mean 100%. how would you so what we've tapped into and, and noticed, obviously, with school being out, um, there's nobody going to school, but those lunch programs are still in effect. So we're, we're noticing oh. and we're tapping into whatever we can that, um, you know, these programs are still set up so these kids could get lunch. A lot of the hospitals, not so much your, your medical hospitals, not those aren't the hospitals that I'm talking about. But I'm talking about like your halfway houses, your recovery hospital programs, uh, therapy type um, facilities where they did have a food program and those are gone, but they still need to eat. So we've kind of stepped in and said, listen, this is what we can provide for you if you allow us to do it. Um, we've, we've had to, to change some of the, th the ways that we operate, um, some of the companies that we use. So I'm very fortunate to be in a populated area, but I'm kind of in the middle of an industrial area. So around me are a lot of pharmaceutical companies, um, car park manufacturers, et cetera, and um, Coca-Cola's around me. So, I mean, and these are companies that employ thousands of people at their plant. So what happens is, or what has happened is, they've lost all or some of their food programs because there's been a reduction in workforce. So since there's a reduction in workforce, they're not feeding the masses like they were. So that's where we stepped mm -hmm. in. So we've been lucky enough to um, provide for these companies as well. As you can see the picture that's um, on there as well, 
on the screen right now, that's actually my son filling those boxes. We had to move to PETA, I think is what it's called. Um, they have to be micro microwavable and biodegradable. And a lot of these programs, there's not a lot of wiggle room uh, to create these elaborate meals and incorporate the, the new cost that we're having now for all these to-go boxes and containers. So we're definitely shopping for the best prices, but also we're bringing in pro paper products that are good for the environment and that are definitely within the guidelines of the programs that we're working with. And that has made a huge difference. Um, I never thought cooking breakfast would be fun, um, but it is. It, it's it's really created so many so much diversity, and one of our biggest concerns was to keep the doors open. It has it has to make sense. It has to be a profitable business for us to want to do this. And we have food costs, we have paper products costs, but also the one thing that I really wanted to do was I have a workforce. These people with almost zero time notice were said, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, but we're not opening up the dining room, so I don't have a position for you right now. Well, through these programs, it's been really nice that I've been able to call back a lot of my wait staff, especially back of the house, and said, hey, listen, this is what we're doing three to four times a day. It starts at six o'clock in the morning, which now, as of last week, four o'clock in the morning is when we start for a 6 a.m. breakfast. And this goes until nine o'clock at night is our last um, delivery that we do for the night shift at one of the local companies. So that's a full day to bring in and to start two to three shifts now, I'm sorry, two to three shifts per day that one, all, once all this started, the pandemic, those were not available. So it's been refreshing that we've been able to do that as well. Well, and it's, it's also that the reallocation of uh, of your staff versus having to let them go, just, you know, put them in different areas. So um, I did want to, I don't know if I can put this up there because uh, it's getting all wonky again, but Jason Williams did have a question kind of to that effect. Um, do you think it's the wrong time to open a business? Most likely. He says he's more of a prep guy, but doesn't have the experience. There it is. It finally catches up. Doesn't have the experience on the business side. And do you have any tips on how to get better on the business side? Uh, don't get me wrong. He practices at home, but it doesn't seem like it's enough. He's got 19 years of being a prep person. <laughs> so if you have no business acumen, I would say at this point, it's probably not a good time to open up, but keep honing those skills. I mean, what kind of info do you have for him on that, Tori? <laughs> Jason, if you want to call me privately, I don't think there's ever a good time to open up a restaurant <laughs> with this kind of business. Um, no, but it's saying that this is all I've ever done in my whole life. We've been in business now. My family started this 50 years ago. Uh, Manja Bevy was our 33rd entity, um, including restaurants, food trucks, bars, nightclubs. You wow. Um, so honestly, and, and, and I do stand by that. I, I really don't know that there's ever uh, the right time to open up a restaurant, but <laughs> that's that's nice, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, especially now, I, I hate coining these terms because I, I don't want to hear them anymore, but these are definitely times of uncertainty. Yeah. And I know that our next step, our next phase, once they allow us to open up the dining rooms, um, we're going to operate at 25% capacity. I'll tell you right now, I have zero interest in wanting to do that. At 25% capacity, I have to bring in all of my front of the house staff back again, there's not enough business to support that kind of payroll and that kind of overhead. I've already talked to my landlord. One of the ideas that we have, because if I understand correctly, at least in California, if you're outdoors, it's a little more lax. So I actually asked my dining room, my uh, landlord, if I could just set my dining room outside. I do have a beautiful patio, um, but that would not sustain the amount of volume that we were doing if it were to come back in that kind of fashion. So, uh, Jason, real quick, just to answer your question, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I would not open anything right now. Um, 
But that, I mean, that kind of brings me to the next point that I wanted to talk to you about is that uh, you, you were predominantly dine in and stuff, but now you say you have no desire. If you can't open up at full capacity, it's not going to pay for it. So you really, you're trying to ride this, uh, I don't want to say the catering side of it, but you know, you're going to use that for what you can right now. Is that something you're going to, once you can open up 100% again, are you going to continue that? I mean, is this kind of a new uh, revenue stream that you see? Well, like I said, yes, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that we were able to tap into this. The thing, that, the one thing that concerns me is, is this happening because of the lockdown during this pandemic? Because yeah. are these programs going to be available once we do open up the country again? Um, uh, right now, I don't know if you have a picture of this, but my dining room looks like a warehouse. It, it, there's absolutely no remnants of anything that would resemble a dining room. All my tables are all um, placed all next to each other in assembly line fashion. Um, boxes, of, there you go, that's it. Uh, boxes upon boxes of to-go containers and, and, and lids and bottoms and tops and all the stuff that we need to assemble all this stuff. Um, so at this point, to continue what I'm doing in feeding uh, the community in this manner, there's no way that I could put my dining room back together again, and, and it would actually be a disservice to my customer. I would not want my customer to sit in here and, and look at this catastrophe in here. Whereas if I set my dining room outside or just kept the patio, um, the weather's beautiful here in Southern California, and that would, that would be something that I would do for the new normal. Um, and I would probably just operate during dinner hours. I wouldn't even, you know, I would keep the daytime, uh, just focus on preparing these, we call them box lunches, um, that I'm actually offering now to the general public because of the popularity of them. I mean, it's just they, they're prepackaged. Everything that you need it, that you need is in there. You just grab and go and, and that's what we're doing now. Well, again, it's a kind of that new normal, like you were saying. Um, you just got to pivot on it. And, you, know, you see them here, the sandwich, uh, I assume some salad pasta and some chips, something yeah, like that. Exactly. But, I mean, yeah, so definitely, uh, I like how you said, I mean, the, the only reason you're doing it is because you can't offer the same quality of service. Try to do this, which is actually keeping your restaurant going and serving your customers so if you have an option of a separate dining room or something like that let you said maybe outside on the patio because on ocean side we all know it's beautiful every day of the year so that's that's what i heard he says what uh, jason also uh, says what about getting a food truck i have heard a lot of people go into that um I'm not so sure about that because i mean now you're taking the uh you're going to a lot of different spots or i guess you could just you know kind of go to one spot and just stay there but um i mean these are all great questions Jason. you can reach out to, to either me or or tori or anything like that um and you know we'll get uh all the answers that you need here i appreciate the uh interactivity for sure so i did want to say i mean you so you're just as far as you can see right now you're just kind of going to be focusing on the um food programs and you said that there is no certainty that you're going to keep these quote unquote contracts when we all open back up so um if you can if there's some i mean is this, this was a catering side that maybe you didn't have before is that something you're going to at least maybe not through the government programs but try to offer catering for other people well that's one thing that um we, we operate five restaurants within a 45 mile radius right now i'm guessing so that is one thing that we have been talking about is mm -hmm. maybe not so much using our actual restaurants to do that, but maybe collaborating all together in a centralized area to have an industrial type kitchen um, where we can continue to do this and have all the right stuff in place so that it operates exactly as that. Um, I know my brother just called me yesterday and he had some questions with an, an offer that he was um, propositioned with. And, and he asked me, like, you know, as far as like assembly lines and, and putting this together and, you know, ordering, you know, what my input was on this. 
And so this is something that if this keeps happening and instead of trying to do it out of a restaurant to actually do it in a location where it yeah. makes more sense. Right. Well, absolutely. I mean, and this is another one of those things where the situation has kind of kicked everybody in the ass to get this one thing done that they've been wanting to do, or, you know, it's made us all jumpstart and accelerate certain plans. So, um, are there, is there like, what's kind of your best? Oh, there you go. All right. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, ciao for now. He's probably off to the hunt lines in Africa or something like that. We'll, we'll see you later, Rudy Waldner. Ciao, Rudy. <laughs> but, um, I mean, this is a, if, if there's like kind of one, best tip you can give anybody going through hard times right now i know it's different for different locations and, and regions what's the, like the best tip the, the biggest lesson you've learned from this that you can tell people to to take from you i'm glad that you asked me that because um i do know a lot of people and i do know a lot of people that do what i do and i've basically been able to categorize them in two categories and i know we all have our own you know, our self demons that we deal with in every situation is different, but your first group is the ones that just want to give up, that don't want to fight. And then your second group is the group their mom in. Like, I'm not giving up. It's going to take a lot more than COVID um, to bring me down. So I'm a fighter and I'm going to make this happen. So first and foremost, you have to figure out what do you want? Do you want to just lay down and let this go by, or do you want to stand up and fight? If you do want to stand up and fight, then get involved. Um, call your, your chamber of commerce and say, hey, listen, this is what I have. This is what I can do. Is there any programs that I can assist with? You know, when we started, and it was just, a, you know, a limited amount of, of uh, lunch boxes that we were doing, you know, just for a couple hundred bucks a day, I just felt like, wow, I'm getting up real early in the morning, spending a lot of money to really not turn that big of a profit right now. But as the second one built off of the, as the third one built off of the second one and so on and so forth, we're up to about 1,500 lunch boxes a week right now. And wow. that's what's made a difference. So if, if you can get involved, um, Call your chamber of commerce, get involved with the community, see what programs are out there. If you're in California, um, Lars, Leah, Michael Wolf, um, yeah. I don't know if I'm missing anybody. We, Michael, just got, uh, we just got contacted yesterday. Our governor has put together a program called uh, Plates for Great Plates for the Elderly or something like that. Don't quote me on that, but basically, what it is, is we all have the opportunity to put in a bid um, to feed our senior citizens here at a more personal level, um, custom made breakfast, lunch and dinner that we're actually, depending on what kind of volume we have, we'll actually deliver ourselves or we'll use um, one of our third party apps just to do the delivery part for us. Um, so we're in the final stages of working that out yesterday. I was in contact with uh, finalizing our menus for them. And it, if that goes through and there's enough volume, we bid it high enough where it's fair enough that it'll, it'll make a substantial difference for us. And I hope that um, Leah and, and Mike and Lars are listening to this because I, I, the kind of numbers and, and volume that they're asking us for um, could be the difference in us running at full capacity with all of my staff back without a dining room or not. Yeah. Well, Michael Stevens, too, up in Aurora Grande, you guys oh, yeah, are all nice. Californians are big enough state. You have so many um, areas to where you're not stepping on each other's toes. Um, we did have a lot of great viewers. This is the last chance to ask Tori some questions about the unique things he's doing, maybe get some advice. Um, I did want to just, I mean, on that seniors that, that, um, meals for seniors or something like that but I, I, I don't know the name we'll try to find that out for you guys but do they have strict the strict guidelines because obviously seniors are the most um, perceptible to getting this virus um, do they come with the specific guidelines as far as like how you have to distribute the food I mean is yes. it different than what you would do in your, in your regular restaurant um, definitely so Dietary restrictions, you know, they, they gave us an, um, 
allowed, you know, milligrams of sodium and then allowed milligrams of uh, sugars, you know, far as like, you know, whatever drinks. If we're going to do a juice, it has to be 100% juice. And oh. that's actually, we can, we can work with that. That's the easy part. Um, the part that's hard is they have to sign up for this program and they actually have to qualify. Um, so we're going to be putting ourselves on the front line because some of the one of the one of the qualifications, not the only one, but uh, to sign up for it, if you are COVID nineteen positive, um, that is one of the ways that you can sign up for this program. So, uh, not only are we going to be packaging the food by their guidelines, but then also now, if we're going to be the delivery service, we are putting in new guidelines for obviously no contact delivery. Um, we're right, already right. Bearing... I'm sorry, Brian. No, I was just saying that you were saying that uh, they can, if they are positive for COVID-19, they can also sign up for this. So that's an, an extra level of uh, protection you have to take for your staff and, and everybody else. Exactly. Exactly. So, it's, they, you uh, know, and it's just because just you get the virus doesn't mean you don't get to eat good food. So I, I think that's, right? a, that's a really good well, it's a, I think it's a really good program. We can't forget about anybody who has it. It's it's hard enough to be quarantined when you're healthy, let alone if you're if you're sick. Um, so I guess you know anybody can kind of reach out to the chamber of commerce or local governments and see if they're doing any of these kind of I don't want to call it charity, but charitable programs to help people out in need. Um, but it looks like just one little more affirmation for the pizza industry, man. Uh, just some uh, one positive note. I, I I really like how you said, "Don't lay down and die, fight." That's a good tip. What's just one positive uh, note that you want to give to everybody? Well, I, I think that's you know kind of what uh, what you talked about right there is the one thing that I've noticed in in what we're going through. I know a lot has changed. You know, it, we just celebrated Mother's Day. I didn't even get to see my mother on Mother's Day. And and those are yeah. just things that, that's not how we operate as a family. So my, my kind of like way to end this is the one thing that hasn't changed, and again, I'll use that word, I'm in denial, but people have not stopped eating. And they know where they they know what their restrictions are they know that they can't go to a restaurant but they still want to eat that restaurant quality food so that's where we're at with that stay in front of your captive audience stay in front of your customers let them know hey our doors are open we're here for you come get the food that you're accustomed to eating with us um, pick up delivery whatever services you use let them know that you're here for them well, I mean, that's great. Stay, stay relevant, stay top of mind, forefront. Um, yeah, I, I, I've never heard anybody say it like that. But yeah, no, people haven't stopped eating. Of course. Right. And, they, and they're, they're longing for that social experience again. But even failing that, they're just longing for that restaurant quality food. So that's what you guys in the industry have to offer. So don't ever forget that. Just keep that to the forefront. We got another comment here, just, you know, Williams. Situation like this is designed to break people like us. Keep a strong mind. I try to put it up there. It's not letting me, but yeah, absolutely, man. This is designed to break it. This puts us to the test, holds our feet to the fire, and shows us what we're made of. And what I'm seeing from the pizza industry and restaurant industry in general at this point, too, is um, cooperative teamwork. You know, again, we're all in this together. So let's uh, let's get out of it together. And then we can go back to being competitors, but not until then. So, Tori, uh, if people want to get in touch with you, people like Jason or anybody else, uh, kind of pick your brain about some of the things you're doing, how, what's the best way for them to reach you? I'm available for anybody that wants to talk, that has any questions or I bounce ideas off of me. Um, I believe that my Facebook page does have my phone number on there. Or you can just contact me through, um, my personal um, Facebook page at Notorious, N-A-T-O-R-E-S. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, I mean, just contact me through Messenger, even through uh, Manja's uh, Messenger page. Uh, on my personal page, I believe my uh, cell phone number is on there. 
Um, I would love to hear what they have to say. I would love to be able to answer any questions uh, that they have about what we're going through and how we're dealing with it. Well, absolutely. And I, I like how you say you'd like to hear what they have to say as well, because if you're not learning or trying to adapt, you're standing still and that means you're left behind, which means you're done. So especially right now, we all have to evolve and adapt and, 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 and survive it. So uh, I, I really like how accessible you guys on the U.S. Speeds team are and how willing you are to just talk with strangers, put out your personal information so people can reach out to you. So I want to thank you again from the bottom of my heart, uh, the whole team, even World Pizza Champions, anybody in the pizza industry, anybody. Um, you guys are salt of the earth some of my favorite people to hang around with so i uh, can't wait to get another competition over there tori because it is a beautiful city oceanside thank you so nice so, all right tori well i do appreciate your time i appreciate everybody tuning in uh again if you need to reach uh tori you can go to the facebook page his personal facebook or manja bevy um you see anything that goes through the contact info on on the website and the facebook right for manja bevy do you see all the the any of the contact info that comes through, people reaching out, they can reach you through manjabevy.com? That's correct. Um, actually, okay. it's, uh, yeah, manjabevy.com. Okay. It's actually, that is what, yes, that's, that is what, I couldn't even remember what my website address is. Just just Google it, Manja uh, right? Oceanside. I'll try that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for tuning in, Tori. Thank you so much again for your time. Uh, we'll be back again uh, tomorrow and the next day. Uh, tomorrow, I believe we're going to have a round table with uh, Lars Smith, Dan Uccello, uh, and Joey Carvelis, uh, three great U.S. Feasting guys in different locations. We're going to be talking about, you know, getting your old customers back and getting new ones. I think the big round table discussion is going to be to discount or not to discount. That is the question. So tune in tomorrow, 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, and uh, I'll see you guys then. But until then, you know, you guys stay safe, stay safe. Thank you so much, Tori. You're very welcome, Brian. Stay safe.